Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. I think we're ready to get started here. So thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Amy and I am your webinar host. And today we are going to be talking all about behavioral economics and how to use the principles of behavioral economics to build a better shopping experience for your visitors and customers. I love topics like this where we get to learn more about what makes people tick. And to that end, I am thrilled to welcome today's expert, Claire Schmidt from one of the top CRO agencies out there, Brooks Bell. Claire, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about Brooks Bell. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. I'm so um, excited to be here with you guys today. So I'm Claire Schmidt. I head up consulting and services here at Brooks Bell. Uh, my team and I focus on building and scaling testing programs and supporting our clients' testing initiatives. We do this through a variety of different ways. We do that through end-to-end -end testing, staff augmentation, training, consulting and advisement. And then we also do a variety of special products and services that are focused around uh, areas like testing maturity, personalization, and user experience. So I've been at Brooks Bell now for about six and a half years. And prior to that, I've always been involved in experimentation in some way or another. So either as an analyst, a marketer, a strategist, or a testing manager. I'm a behavioral science enthusiast, an experimentation maturity maven, and I'm often seen as the testing do's and don'ts enforcer. So a little bit about Brooks Bell. We are a digital experimentation consultancy based out of Raleigh, North Carolina. We've been spending the last 15 years building world-class testing programs and helping companies like Gap, Barnes & Noble, and American Girl better leverage their data and their technology staff to help solve digital challenges and deliver a better customer experience. Our mission at Brooks Bell is to make every day better through testing. Our vision is to help companies discover the people behind the data. And our goal is to help companies elevate their testing programs. So whether that's working alongside our clients executing tests or helping our clients build their internal practice and capabilities. Our hope is that when our clients feel ready, they're ready to take full ownership of their testing, personalization, and analytics programs and continue on independently without us. To us, that is a true sign of success. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. And as I mentioned, we are really excited to be able to uh, learn from and share some of the expertise that uh, that you're bringing today. So as I mentioned, my name is Amy Ellis and I am from Full Story. I'm our webinar host for today. And if you're not familiar with Full Story, Full Story is a digital experience platform that makes it easy to search, see, and understand your customer or shopper's experience on your site. So what does that mean for experimentation, for conversion rate optimization? Uh, basically, Full Story is used in experimentation and CRO workflows, typically because it's capturing literally everything that happens in any given customer's experience on your site. So you can get both that big picture CX analytics, like frustration metrics, top users, slowest pages, as well as dive in and understand on an individual level what's holding shoppers back from making it all the way through your funnel. So of course, you can find out more about Full Story at fullstory.com and sign up for a demo. So a few quick um, administrative notes before I hand off to Claire here. So we're gonna answer questions at the end of today's session. Um, so if you have a question that comes up as you're listening to um, Claire talk, go ahead and put that in the questions section and I will be kind of pulling a list together that we will address at the end of the session. If for some reason there are questions we don't get to, we'll include that in our follow-up email, which will also have a recording of today's webinar. So if you want to be able to revisit a lot of the great stuff that Claire's going to share, you'll be able to do that with a recording of that webinar. So now let's dive into behavioral economics. Claire, take it away. Okay, so what is behavioral economics? So actually, before we get into behavioral economics, let's talk traditional economics. Traditional economics states that we all make rational decisions to maximize our own utility. So what this means is, as we get new information, we use that information to help us update and make the best decisions possible. So based on traditional economics, Essentially what it's saying is, we're all super smart people making rational decisions all the time. That sounds great, and I really wish that was the case, but that's not reality. 
What behavioral economics assumes is that people behave irrationally. We make decisions based on how we're feeling and our emotions. And oftentimes what we decide on isn't always in our best interest. This means that even though we have good information to make informed, smart decisions, we don't always follow through with it. Behavioral economics is the science of decision making, so really understanding why people do or don't do things. It focuses in on understanding the impact of rationality, willpower, and selfishness on how we make decisions for ourselves. So here's an example of this. Um, research states that we should be getting eight hours of sleep a night, and if we do, we're going to be happier and we're going to be healthier. We'll have better brain functioning, better physical health, better mental health. However, I bet that less than half of you actually get eight hours of sleep a night. And I also bet that a good portion of you actually stay up late due to your own personal choice. I am absolutely guilty of this. I love TV, like I really love TV. And I stay up at least one evening a night past 2 a.m. binge watching some series on Netflix. Um, my husband's uh, actually a behavioral neuroscientist, and he says that I have one of the worst cases of impulse control he's ever heard of, um, especially when it comes to watching TV. So let's dive into e-commerce and behavioral economics principles. So for e-commerce companies, it is so important for you to use behavioral economics series to drive your testing strategies throughout your customer journey. It's not only going to help you increase your online revenue and demonstrate the true value of your testing program, it's going to provide you with a lot of insight into who your customers are and what motivates them through each step of their purchasing process. So in this webinar today, we're going to talk about a, different, uh, a bunch of different behavioral economics principles that are going to have great impact on your customer's purchasing decisions. And we'll also talk about few, a few strategies on how to apply those principles to your e-commerce experience. So we'll cover social proof, choice overload, scarcity and loss aversion, and incentives. So to get started figuring out how to apply these behavioral science principles, the first thing you need to do is not be yourself. I know that sounds crazy, um, but what you really need to do is you need to put yourself in the mindset of your customer. What you have to remember is you are experts um, on your company's website. You know it inside and out. You know how it works. You know all the features and functionalities. So what that makes you is not your typical user. So be your customer. Think about their experience from different segments like prospects or even frequent returning uh, big spenders. Once you put yourself into their shoes, you're going to be totally amazed at the things that pop out on your site that you never consider to even be a road bump or an issue. Next, take the time to map out your customer's purchasing journey. It can be in a flow chart like you see on the screen. You want to look at every single page, every single step, and every single decision point from homepage all the way to confirmation. So once you've created this customer journey map, the key is to dive into the data. You want to make sure you're looking at both your quantitative and your qualitative data. And what that's going to help you do is identify where, how, and why your customers are getting stuck. So take a look at visitor segments, take a look at page metrics, also take a look at fallout rates as people go through that funnel. Full Story is a great resource for you to use. Watch session replays, investigate specific segments in their health, discover different user trends, and then make sure you're looking at metrics like rage clicks and error clicks. You'll get a lot from those. The other thing to look at is voice of customer survey feedback. And then another thing that people often don't do, but I recommend that you do, is talk to your customer service reps. They have a wealth of knowledge of all the issues your customers are having, and they're also hearing it firsthand from them. All of this data is going to really help you better identify what those key sticking points are. So once you've identified the sticking points and the road bumps in your customer journey, you want to prioritize those areas that you want to test on based on potential impact. So when I say potential impact, I'm talking about what if you tested on those areas, 
what's going to drive the most value to their business, and what's going to cause the biggest difference. So once you've created that sort of testing hit list, it's now time to start strategizing and applying those behavioral economics principles. So the first one is social proof. So here's an example of social proof by Cialdini. This is around those signs in hotel bathrooms um, asking you to reuse your towels. You guys have all probably seen some variation of this sign uh, depending on what hotel brand you stay with. So Cialdini and his fellow researchers wanted to see if social proof would sway people to reuse their towels during their hotel stay. So the control in this experiment was help save the environment. The environment deserves your respect. You can show your respect by reusing your towel. So for his test, he created a new variation, which he called the guest identity norm. What it said was, join your fellow guests in helping save the environment. 75% of guests at this hotel, the one you're staying at, reuse their towels. Do you think it led to an increase? It did. 26% more guests reused their towels. Cialdini and his um, fellow researchers took it one step further, and they did a social, sorry, excuse me, a same room identity norm. And what this version said was, join your fellow guests. 75% of people who stayed in room 321 reused their towel. Do you think that motivated people? It did. It increased by 49%. So what he learned here was that the more specific the group that users can identify with without getting like too personal, the more it motivated them and the more they found that information relevant. So social proof, we're all pretty familiar with it. We see it everywhere and we really use it um, on a regular basis to make decisions. When people who are unsure of a course of action, they often look to others for direction. So social proof is really effective in implying to others that a behavioral behavior is acceptable and it's normal to follow. So some things to keep in mind with social proof. Use social proof to sway those that are undecided or don't know what, to de what decision to make. So for example, if you're shopping for a shirt and you know that others are super happy with that shirt, one would assume that you too would also be happy with it. Social proof enforces in people's minds that a behavior is correct and normal. An example of this is a bartender. So a bartender at the beginning of her shift throws a few of her own dollars into her tip jar to get those tips rolling. When you come into the bar and get a drink, it's a reminder to you that you should tip and that other people felt that that service was great. Decisions are often made quickly, so social proof is easy to comprehend and it really takes no time to process. So that's why symbols and pictures are super effective. So in this example here on the screen, just looking, by looking at the pictures above and seeing all these people so comfortable in their new bed, it makes me want to be with them, be like them. I want to sleep just as soundly and as comfortably as Audrey Glass. Don't use social proof if you want to, people to process information carefully. And make sure the social proof you use is relevant to your audience. So make sure that people identify with the group providing that social proof, like in that Cialdini experiment. So e-commerce companies use social proof in a variety of different ways to communicate the benefits of their products and services. So some ways or some strategies to apply social proof are product recommendations, so people who viewed this product also viewed these other products. It's essentially telling people what products they should be looking at, and it's a great way of introducing people to new products. Star ratings. This is great for giving customers a really quick read on the satisfaction of a product. Um, I really like to see the ratings distribution, so see how those reviews panned out across the one through five stars. Um, another way is customer reviews. So explore reasons why a product did or didn't work for someone. This allows you to actually dig in a little bit deeper and get more specifics as to what they didn't like about a product. Um, the other one I like um, around this is how it fits. So some retail companies have this, um, 
this feature where it ends up just being so important because with every shirt cut in style, a size small can be drastically different even within the same brand. So by hearing from others who bought this shirt, it helps you eliminate that guesswork and that uncertainty. And then lastly, testimonials. This gives you a better understanding of why someone loved a product or a company, and you really get a sense for the value that they derived from it. Okay, so choice overload. All right, so has this ever happened to you? You finally decided that you were gonna paint that guest room in your house blue. You went to Home Depot to get paint and then instantly became overwhelmed. You initially had this you know, idea that you were like, I'm gonna get a medium shade of blue. But when you got to that paint section and realized that there were at least 40 different shades of blue, you immediately became paralyzed. So what you thought was gonna be a really quick purchase of blue paint ended up being four trips to Home Depot, um, an exploration of colors that actually weren't blue, and now your guest bedroom walls look like a unicorn threw up on it. In the end, you pick a shade of blue, but in the back of your mind, there is this seed of doubt. You are wondering if you made that right decision. Should you have gone one shade lighter? Should you have gone one shade darker? Should you have just picked red altogether? What you experienced was choice overload. So choice overload is when we are given too many options, we tend to make the easiest decision, which is no decision at all. So what you end up suffering from is what we call decision paralysis. So for example, if you see a high bounce rate on a category page, it might be because your customers are overwhelmed by the number of choices available to them. Choice load is uh, its a really interesting uh, behavioral economics principle because it requires you to think about ways, about, uh, ways to simplify your e-commerce experience and figure out a way on how to make decision making easier for your customers. We call this the path of least resistance. What can you do to make it as easy as possible for people to make a choice and complete an action? So th some things to keep in mind here. More isn't necessarily better. People like options, but not too many to the point where it holds up decision making. Just looking here at this example of polo shirts, I'm just overwhelmed by the fact that there's 154 different polo shirts to choose from. Too many choices make us less happy with what we select. This is often known as shopper's remorse. People feel they made the wrong decision when given too many options. It's like that saying, the grass is greener on the other side. And then lastly, reduce, simplify, and eliminate choices within your conversion path. So how do we get to that path of least resistance? How do we get people from point A to point B without getting them sidetracked on your site? So some strategies for overcoming choice overload. Uh, the first one is badges. So product badges are like mini promotional stickers that you can add to your products. They're really great for calling attention to specific products. They make it easier for customers to find products that they're looking for. Um, it helps customers make quicker purchasing decisions. And it's a great way to efficiently educate customers on product benefits. So some examples of badges are things like, uh, in the first example from Patagonia, um, new, there's also bestseller, top rated. Those are uh, badging copy to, that adds value. You can also identify specific um, unique attributes. So made in America, limited edition. And then there's other things where you can highlight things like weather, time of year, holiday related promotions. So you can have fall must haves or holiday specials. Or here on this Patagonia example, they actually tell you um, what temperatures this coat is actually good for. So when you're using badges, make sure that you test what messages are most effective. Um, you also can test colors, positions, shapes, and sizes. One of the things with badges, though, use some restraints. It is very easy to get carried away with different types of badges. So make sure you limit the number of badges displayed on um, a single product or on a category page. You don't want to add to the confusion and that uh, choice overload. 
Next is defaults. So people see defaults as guides or recommendations of what to choose. It really pulls them out of that um, state of decision paralysis. Um, you have to be careful though. People are not stupid. Make sure you choose your default wisely. If you go and you just pick um, the highest price, your customers are gonna see through it. There needs to be some obvious reason to customers as to why that item was chosen as the default. So make sure that that value is clearly um, identified. Um, other strategies for helping customers feel not overwhelmed or overburdened by data or information is testing content hierarchy. So if you know that there is specific information that's critical in moving your customers from one stage to the next, make sure you surface that information you know, up top or more prominently. Next is autofill information where you can. So if you have your customer's information, use it. Don't make them fill it in, fill it in again. Um, that's just annoying. And then reduce the number of pages in your checkout funnel. Fewer steps are typically better. Um, I will say, though, that there is an exception uh, to this, and this is high-priced or high-consideration items. A little effort, a little resistance is actually good because what it does is it helps to reinforce the product value and it actually makes people feel a little bit more secure in making that big purchase or that big decision. Um, in a way, you want it to, um, that experience of checking out, you want it to mirror that mental process they went through when initially deciding on that item. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Amy to take us through um, a case study. Yeah, thank you. So this is really just a quick story that um, I think is really interesting, especially when viewed through the lens of choice overload, because it's such a great example of both how impactful it can be to use your quantitative and qualitative data to um, impact your experimentation strategy to sort of guide you in the right direction and when you really know what your audience is looking for you can be pretty bold in creating that path of least resistance so let me explain this uh, story here so beta brand had been doing some experimenting around first-time visitors and how to increase add to cart among that specific audience and they have a really popular they have lots of popular products but they have one that is especially popular among first-time visitors and it's this dress pant yoga pant and i actually have a pair they're extremely comfortable they really do feel like yoga pants but they look really nice um so if anyone's looking for some pants i i can recommend them um and so because it's a popular product naturally they wanted to create lots of variations of it so there's several different cuts and lots of different colors and so initially they were for uh, doing some personalization. So first time visitors land on the site and they really highlight that product that they know that first time visitors are interested in. And on the left here, you see that initially they were really trying to highlight the options that were available. And that makes a lot of sense, right? You wanna let people know, hey, we have something here for you. But what their data showed is that through all of that, even with the options for first time visitors, they typically want the classic dress pant yoga pant in black. So they did another test where they reduced the options they showed to first time visitors and they just focused on that product that they knew that audience wanted. And they were able to increase by quite a bit the add to cart among that audience segment. So um, I always think that's a, such a fascinating um story and a really great example of those behavioral economics principles because it doesn't exactly seem like the rational decision to do but it worked really well in this case great thanks amy that's a great example of path of least resistance and content hierarchy within um, um choice overload all right, so moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about scarcity and loss aversion. So to start things off, um, let's talk a little bit about mattress companies. Uh, the ones I'm talking about are the ones that deliver mattresses packaged in what seems to be impossibly small size boxes for a size of a mattress. These companies pay so much attention to the idea of loss aversion. 
Their focus is on making sure their customers feel confident in buying a mattress, and they spend a lot of time easing customer anxieties. Because you know what, bottom line, buying a mattress is no joke. One third of your life is spent on a mattress, you use it every single day, and they're crazy, crazy expensive. So in this example above from Casper, um, they do a lot of different things to help ease loss aversion for their clients. They hint at value, premium quality at an amazing price. They do social proof, love and trusted by 1 million customers, America's number one rated mattress. And then they ease your anxieties about extra costs and getting your mattress into your house. They say free shipping and returns. But my favorite is sleep on this mattress for 100 nights, zero commitment. Essentially, they're telling you, you lose nothing by trying out this mattress. No shopper's remorse whatsoever. If you think about it, this is pretty, um, pretty genius. Uh, I bet very few people actually return a mattress. And the reason for that is one, after you've slept on a mattress for 100 nights, over three months, in your mind, that mattress is now pretty much yours. This is called the endowment effect. You've pretty much claimed ownership of it. And two, returning a mattress seems like way more trouble than it's worth. If you think about it, you have to find the phone number to call customer service. You have to talk to customer service. You have to explain to them why you don't want it. You need to schedule a pickup time. And then you need to take off time from work to wait for the delivery, for the pickup guy to come. So no thank you. Scarcity says that people are motivated by shortage, while loss aversion plays on your customer's feeling of losing out on something, even if it isn't theirs yet. So some things to keep in mind. Losses loom, losses loom larger than gains. So for example, we are more emotionally impacted when someone takes an item away from us than we, were, we felt the joy in when they first gave it to us. People quickly assume ownership of things, like a mattress. This is that endowment effect. You can, get a, you can get around loss aversion by inspiring customers with value and then also reminding them how far they've come or how much they've already invested. So for example, Enterprise Rent-A-Car does a great job messaging customers. If customers start to take actions that pull them out of that reservation flow, what they do is they surface a pop-up that says, are you sure you want to discard your reservation? The other thing people hate to break are streaks. They don't want to lose out on things they've already invested or have already earned. An example of this is Snapchat. So Snapchat has something called snap streaks. This is where they keep a tally of how many consecutive days you and one of your friends uh, exchange, snap each other. So we're talking like actual snaps and not chat. Um, there were reports that people couldn't find anything meaningful to snap to each other. And so what they were doing is they were just sending their friends random pictures of the floor or other items just so that they can uphold their snap streak. So here are some strategies for applying uh, scarcity and loss aversion. The first is inventory limit. This creates the perception that something is scarce. If people think that your product is difficult to get or only available for a short period of time, they really end up placing a lot more value on it and they feel more pressure to take action immediately. In this example here from Etsy, um, Etsy lets you know how many products, uh, how many items are left of a product. Uh, they also have, um, not in this example, but another example, uh, how many people have that product in their cart. Another thing is a countdown climber, timer. Um, this creates the perception that something is in high demand. So we often see this in checkout carts. If a purchase isn't made within a, a X number of minutes, the item gets removed from the shopping cart. Um, this is very prominent on ticket buying companies. So you're usually given 15 minutes to complete your purchase. Um, otherwise, those seats that you spent a lot of time picking out just get added back into the general pool. You also see countdowns around major promotional periods. So 
all the big retail stores um, have countdown clocks when it comes to Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And you also see bigger brands sort of take advantage of this idea of loss aversion uh, by introducing their own promotional days like Amazon Prime Day and also Wayfair's Way Day. Um, you can also use limited time promotions, which is equally motivating. Uh, studies found that people's desire to um, save money doesn't necessarily drive them to make purchase. However, they end up being a lot more motivated um, to purchase by the possibility of actually missing out on an opportunity to get something special or to save money. Uh, Starbucks, their pumpkin spice latte is a really good example of this. It's only sold in the fall, it's in high demand, and occasionally you end up hearing about different Starbucks locations running out. Um, E-commerce companies can also um, uh, take advantage of limited time promotions by monitoring their customers' wish lists. It's a great opportunity to notify customers when an item on their wish list is running low or it's on sale. And then lastly, one other thing you can do is create messaging um, around an experience or a value that customers don't want to pass up. An example of this is for mattresses. Um, a perfect night's sleep is one click away. Or in the case of these slippers, isn't it time you give your feet a break? So now let's talk about incentives. So incentives, everyone of all ages are motivated by incentives. I was trying to think back to when I was really affected and truly motivated and driven by an incentive. And what came to mind was Book It. I don't know if any of you um, are familiar with Book It or remember it, uh, but if you grew up in the US in the 80s and 90s, um, there was a partnership between Book It and Pizza Hut. Book It is an organization that tries to get kids to read more. So this uh, campaign between Book It and Pizza Hut was super effective. It was read a book, get a coupon for a free personal pan pizza at Pizza Hut. Parents must have hated it. Kids loved it. I loved it. I churned through so many books so fast just so that I can get those coupons. My family, for about five years, we ate Pizza Hut at least once a month. And now um, that I look back on it, I blame Pizza Hut and incentives for why I was so chubby as a kid. So incentives provide motivation for someone to take action or make a decision. So some things to keep in mind around incentives. Incentives are effective in encouraging a behavioral change. We see this a lot, right, with parents. They're promising dessert to kids if they eat their vegetables. Incentives can also help to build loyalty. So if you have a loyalty program for your customers, incentives can help keep customers engaged, coming back, and purchasing more. You can incentivize customers with money, things, social points. Um, for example, HelloFresh. They offer a financial incentive here of get 50% off your first box. But what they're also doing is incentivizing you in terms of time savings. They say, we shop, plan, and deliver. So you can re just relax and enjoy all there is to love about cooking and eating. One of the things around financial incentives, um, you need to watch out for them. Financial incentives can be a slippery, slippery slope. Customers may start to only wait for special promotional periods before making purchases on your site, or they might start associating your brand as a discount brand. So in terms of applying incentives, uh, from a financial perspective, there are a lot of different ways to apply these incentives. So you've got like things like money back guarantees, like in that mattress example, you've got special offers, you have buy one, get one offers, you have discounts. And not only discounts, but discount presentation. So uh, you can present that discount as dollars off or percentage off. For products, you can do free trials or downloads. So try this product online for one month and then decide to purchase. And then there's also um, emotional or functional benefits. A great example of this is Tom's Shoes. 
they built their business around making an impact in the world. So one of the first emotional benefits that they um, did when coming out was buy a pair of shoes and they'll give one to someone in need. So currently on their site, they have one now, it's called Stand for Tomorrow, Pick a Stand. And what they're doing is they'll give you a $10 discount for choosing an issue you want to support. And then Tom will then donate a portion of sales to that cause. So in terms of incentives, for this, they're not only giving you a financial incentive of $10, but also that emotional incentive, that benefit and satisfaction of knowing that you're helping and contributing to a cause. So we've just talked about a lot of things in a really short period of time, but just to recap, so before applying behavioral economics principles and strategies, we really need to better understand our customers. So one, you need to become your user and see your website through their eyes. Two, you need to map out your customer journey. Map out every decision point and every page that they're going through. Three, use your data to suss out what points are problems and what's causing issues with your customers. And then four, prioritize those different areas you wanna test based on impact. So what's gonna bring you the greatest return? So now in applying behavioral economics, we talked about for actually five principles. Uh, we talked about social proof. When people are unsure of a course of action to take, they often look to others for direction. So social proof is effective in implying to others that a behavior is acceptable and it's also normal. Choice overload. When given too many options, people take, tend to take the easiest, make the easiest decision, which essentially is no decision at all. They suffer from decision paralysis. We also discussed here uh, path of least resistance, is how do we make it as easy as possible for people to make a choice or complete an action? We talked about scarcity and loss aversion. So scarcity says that people are motivated by shortage, and loss aversion plays on customers' fear of losing out on something. We also talked here about endowment effect, where people quickly take ownership of things, even if it isn't theirs yet. And then lastly, we talked about incentives. Incentives provide motivation for someone to take an action or make a decision. Just watch out for those financial ones. So if you wanna dig a little bit further uh, into behavioral economics, uh, I suggest that you take, check out some of these great reads um, by Dan Ariely, Robert Taldini, and Richard Thaler. Um, the other place is you can go to brooksbell.com backslash resources. Uh, we have a whole section there on behavioral economics, um, which are additional resources and some behavioral science insights. Thank you so much for your time today, and good luck uh, testing out these behavioral science principles on your own site. Thank you so much, Claire. That was great. I love learning about that sort of thing and, and starting to uh, recognize when you see those principles at play, when you are, when we're you know, shopping ourselves or when we're working with um, other clients and, and customers. So we have a few minutes here for questions and I have a couple here. Um, so this person says, you talked a lot about behavioral science principles and strategies to apply to the earlier part of the customer journey. Do you have any more suggestions for the checkout flow? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about choice overload and we talked about um, reducing the number of pages in that flow. And then we also, um, another way is the progressive uh, reveal approach. Um, that's also a great way to apply uh, that choice overload principle to the actual checkout flow. Another principle um, that applies is called goal gradient hypothesis. There was this study that was done um, a while back where scientists had a mouse that ran from one end of a mouse size hallway to the other end. And what they found was when they placed food or a motivator at one side, they noticed that as the mouse got closer to the food, it actually ran faster. So translating this to e-commerce, um, people will work harder um, to achieve a goal if that goal is closer. So a great way to apply this is a progress bar in your user, uh, in your checkout flow. So 
if people have an understanding of how close they are to an endpoint um, or checkout completion, they're more motivated to actually complete that process. Um, one other thing that uh, comes to mind is, um, and this may apply to your checkout, it may not, is this idea, this principle around display of effort. So people place more value um, on work that they do themselves, um, and then they have this perceived value on work that they see others do. So an example of this is, um, let's just say for Expedia, um, you type in you know, your requirements for what slides you want. And essentially, while it's processing and thinking, you see that spinning wheel, and then they have those little messages that pop up that says, you know, checking, like, checking all flights that leave Raleigh at X amount of time, or, you know, trying to find you the best discounts. Um, that is an example of display of effort. Um, even though um, it's really taking them no time at all, but to the user's mind, it's, it feels like Expedia is actually working for them. So you can do things like that within your checkout flow as well. So you might just wanna drop one of those in as people hit the checkout button to say looking for, let's just say, last minute discounts or special promotions for you. Um, that helps to gain sort of customer loyalty and satisfaction. Awesome, I love those. And um, another question, when can, or are there times when a behavioral economics principle might back, backfire? Uh, yeah, so um, I mentioned um, about that a little bit. Um, I talked about high-priced or big decision items. Um, in that case, social proof is not for you. So things like signing up for a mortgage, um, social proof is not really going to be effective in that. There's just so many factors to consider and there's so much research and information that one needs to process in order to make that decision. Um, the other thing is that behavioral economics principles are sort of um, overarching guidelines. Um, but what really it comes down to and whether or not um, a behavioral economics principle is appropriate is your user, right? So different segments behave differently and they're going to react differently to different strategies. So for example, what you present to senior citizens, what motivates them to take an action or make a decision is going to be oftentimes completely different than um, what motivates, let's just say, um, a millennial. So you just need to take into account who that segment and that user group is before you apply those principles. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And again, sort of goes back to the importance of starting out by really understanding your users and their motivations, diving into that, to the data that you have and uh, mapping out that customer journey, which I think uh, we also have a question here. Um, how many choices would be the recommended standard to offer users? Um, and I wonder if that kind of goes back to understanding your users too, but I wonder where do you guys, do you ever have a best practice that you typically recommend? Um, on how many choices to offer uh, users or customers? Um, right. I think that it, de it depends. It really depends on what your testing strategy is. Um, I also think it depends as to what your hypothesis is and how you're structuring your test. But the other thing it really depends on, too, is the amount of traffic you have. That will actually help dictate the amount of traffic and how long you want to run a test. That will actually help dictate how many different sort of variations that you would want to even present to a customer. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and related to that, actually, we have another question that asks sort of at what point can you start um, testing some of these strategies, like how many customers or visitors should you have? And um, I wonder if that also relates to like, is there a size at which it's um, more valuable to start experimenting? Hmm. Well, I think you can start experimenting regardless of how many customers you have. Um, you can even start experimenting using um, user research. 
uh, you can do surveys, yeah, that's you can a do great things recommend. like that. Yeah, so like that is something you can do right out of the gate. But if you want to start thinking about like A-B testing, that is when you need to start looking at your testing parameters and determining, um, uh, you know, when do you have, you know, the right amount of traffic, um, when is the right time in between marketing and promotional periods that you can actually execute a test. And there's a lot of, um, if you're using sort of a fixed time horizon approach to testing, um, there's a lot of calculators out there that can help you determine uh, what your minimum sample size actually needs to be in order to run a test. So Adobe has one, I know Maximizer has one as well. Um, so what you pretty much input in is your traffic, your conversion rate, your minimum detectable lift, um, and what confidence level you're looking to achieve. And essentially it'll tell you um, either how many weeks or the number of uh, users you need to have in order to hit that those criteria. Awesome, yeah, that makes sense. And I, and I think, I remember, especially at Full Story, when we were um, just getting started, having fewer customers and a little bit less traffic was actually a great time for us to, to really do a lot of those one-on-one -on -one chats and user interviews and, and get a lot of that really deep uh, qualitative data that just continues to sort of inform what you do as you grow. Yeah, so I know. Um, you oh, go sorry. ahead. Oh, I was just saying, um, taking advantage of um, uh, user research is just in, in qualitative data is just um, it's super important. And you know, a lot of people say, well, that's not statistically significant. But what it does do is, you know, with a small group of people. Um, I think it's like if you have at least seven people, you uncover about 90% of potential problems that customers would come across. So that's a really helpful tool, even though, you know, it doesn't provide you with the hard metrics that, say, an A-B test does. Yeah, awesome. And I think we have time for one more question. So how do I prioritize which part of the journey or roadblock to tackle first? Got it. So. Um, Let's actually, I, I talked a little bit about potential impact, but we should probably just sort of dive a little bit deeper there. So one is potential impact. So is this going to bring value to your company? Um, the other thing to look at is traffic. Like, do you have enough traffic to actually test on that page? Um, you also want to look at level of effort. So level of effort it's going to take to execute that test in terms of um, development, um, analytics, and even creative. And then um, does that test idea, does it align with your KPIs? Um, if it doesn't align with your KPIs, you probably don't want to spend your time doing it, um, unless it's more for um, sort of an outside insights-driven um, reason. Um, and then you also want to make sure that whatever you're testing, you can, one, implement it, and two, uh, you'll get some type of transferable insight from it that can be applied to other parts of your area. So sort of looking at all of these different things, um, you guys should evaluate of these things, which ones are most important to your business and which one holds greater weight. And then from there, you can actually sort of um, build out and prioritize uh, which idea to go first. Awesome. Claire, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, if anyone here is interested in um, chatting with you or with the Brooks Bell team in more depth about um, conversion rate optimization or experimentation strategy, um, where can I reach you? Just brooksbell.com? Yeah, that is, that's perfect. Yep. Okay, awesome. Cool. And um, as I mentioned at the start of the webinar today, we will be sending out a recording of today's content. Um, so you'll be able to revisit all of these principles. And if there were burning questions that we weren't able to get to, we will follow up with those as well. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks for another webinar. Thanks.